I was going to go through the extraordinary background of everyone up here and their history and some of the films, the amazing films they've made in the past, but I'm not going to do that because I think we should get on with the, with a discussion up here first a little bit and then we open it up. And I'd like to start the discussion with Paul Verhoeven, an amazing feat. I've seen all of your movies before this and then after this as well. What brought you to this strange, unusual combination of satire and violence and social commentary and what have you? I want to talk a little bit about the origins and what brought you to the film. Well, well uh, my wife. <laughs> Because I um, thought the script was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, I was living in Europe, you know. That's a different situation. So this for me was like difficult to understand. Let's put it that way. And so I put it aside after 20 pages or something. And then Martin. Um, picked it up, we were at the beach at the Côte d'Azur in France, and um, then I was going for a swim, and she, I came back, and then she said, you, know, you should really read this again. And then you should pay more attention to what you can do with that, and what's there on the page that you haven't seen. And then the second person that has to be uh, acknowledged was Barbara Boyle, because she was at that time at Orion, and she was the one that ultimately convinced me to come over and check it out. And when you came over, you had to put together a team that could capture this very that's unique feel, this, 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 this sensibility that's in between a lot of things. A lot of that was coincidence, I think. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I didn't know anybody here, so uh, it was very difficult for me to choose anybody who are in the crew or in the cast. And I was enormously helped by John Davison and Ed Neumeyer, uh, who, was, who was always uh, with the production, to tell me exactly um, what, uh, what is normal in the United States. <laughs> hey, whatever it was, you didn't do that. Okay. And Michael, I, I, I have a question. In your discussions with Paul, there's a lot of politics in this film. I know from our past, having worked this room in the past with both of you guys, that you had a left critical perspective, yet this is a movie that's come out and has been often criticized from the left in various ways, and a lot of people on the right have, have adopted. What did you talk about with Paul about the politics of the film, and what do you think about it right now, both of you? Well, I didn't know, know anything about the politics, so it just followed what was in the script, really. I had no idea, really, sometimes what it was about, really. <laughs> well, I, 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 I do um, think that Ed and I were both aware that uh, even then, corporations were being treated like people, unfortunately. And uh, Ed actually had a job prior to the writing of it at the, the Black Tower at Universal, and so his sense of what a boardroom was was really I think he had fantasies about killing all those people. <laughs> um, but uh, personally, I, I was a, I protested the Vietnam War, and, and I, I feel that you know American capitalism is pretty much an out of control thing, and, and we sort of brought that to the script, um, you know, in an unbridled fashion. Ed, you're leaving me with that. Uh, uh. Well, um, you know, we were always interested in political ideas for this, and I think that uh, everybody's being pretty modest because we talked a lot about this stuff, and a lot of the stuff we we didn't have to talk about because we just sort of felt that way. And I think that um, one of the things I like about this is uh, my people, my friends on the left like it, or sometimes they don't, but my friends on the right like it too. And uh, I think, uh, as they say, good business is where you find it. Um, uh, uh, male fantasy, uh, action fantasy, is equal opportunity. It doesn't matter where, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the politics of it. I mean, it's, it is about, you know, the future. Uh, I do think that people have equal claims on the future, regardless of, of, of political stripe. And I think that's why this, this, this movie is interesting to people, because there's still issues here that we're talking about as the digital age comes upon us. And 
machines come upon us. And so that's probably why it's, it's still new, you know? On the violence issue, that was one of the things that people keep bringing up and, you know, what, do you have, you have something you want to say about that? All, any of you. Uh, I've said many times I like violence. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I think I was very uh, lucky in meeting Paul because we both have an aesthetic for violence. I, I'm not sure why. My mother is here, and so don't make her feel bad. Uh, you know, I, I could say something about the violence. I, I think because Paul lived in Europe and the sensibility of European directors and African-American directors here uh, is different from people like Tarantino. The violence has consequences. It's not just uh, some kind of fantasy escapade. And I, I, I thought Paul brought that to the project. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Tippett, you, you really are a legend. <laughs> uh, and well, if you live long enough, right? I, I didn't know what to call you, whether it's an animator or a you know, special effects supervisor, but what you are is very clearly a storyteller. And to, for this film, the, 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 the costume, the modern costume, the whole mechanisms that were created are so, are characters in their own right and so integral. You want to talk a little bit about the conception of the, of the, 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 the as it were, effects and, and the animation? Well, yeah, I, I didn't do all the effects. I mean, uh, Pete Coran did a lot of the RoboVision stuff, and mm -hmm. Rocco Geoffrey did the, um, the, all the matte paintings, great matte paintings. So I, I primarily handled the Ed 209 sequences on the show. And, you know, those were all done with conventional stop motion animation. And, uh, you know, it was all, uh, you know, I wouldn't characterize myself as whatever it is you said, but. <laughs> You know, it's, it, in, it's in the good. context that I, I usually work in, and I've, I've enjoyed working with Paul, I, I kind of see myself more as like a, a choreographer working with the director and, and working out how the kinesthetic beats of things and, and the ideas for what these, you know, characters are. And, and, and once we're on the same page, then it's, it's pretty easy to do. And Paul and I always felt, you know, we kind of spoke the same language, and I like violence, so, you know. There, it, at a certain point, when you're on the same wavelength, there's a telepathic thing that's happening, you know. Yeah, I mean, on a very astoundingly low-budget movie, at least from what It was I've, ridiculous. Yeah, what I've read, <laughs> the, the, the RoboCop uniform was pretty expensive and pretty crucial and pretty central. Want to talk a little bit about conceiving it? Well, it was, it was, let me just start here and someone else should jump in, but it was the essential gag of the picture, I think. I mean, everything else had to work, but if Peter and the costume didn't work, I don't think we would have had a movie. Uh, Rob Routine is not here tonight. Rob Routine is the genius who uh, designed the suit. Um, One of the things that I also I thought Paul did very well was the, in introducing Robocop, the first time you see him is on a monitor, then you see him behind frosted glass, then you see him through a fence, and with a very difficult third act face, you first see it in a reflection of a distorted piece of metal. So Paul is not putting it right in your face, he's, he's building an illusion. Yeah. And I thought that was a, a tremendous thing that was brought to the project. Well, that came from Robotin too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he told me when I uh, when the costume when I was working on the costume, he said, "If you are going to show uh, Robocop suddenly like that coming out of the out of a room or whatever, you know, and you see him frontal and and really without any protection, then I think we will have a problem." And he said to me, "You should introduce him step by step. You should introduce a part of him so that the audience gets." accustomed to what they're going to see and that they will not be laughing. And so that was the reason that it was done that way, but I have to really acknowledge that the idea came from Rob Poutine. All right. Peter Weller, you had to wear it. You had to be inside it. You also had another challenge. Yeah, thank God I don't have to now. Well, <laughs> you know, you had a challenge because your role involved being very human and very mechanical, that you had to be convincing on both Accounts. Do you want to talk a little bit about approaching that role? What did you do to well, prepare? And well, first I got to acknowledge, like with Paul, acknowledge and 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 Mike, the uh, the gifted applicator of that makeup, Stefan Dupuis. I don't know if you know Stefan Dupuis, but you know he's just uh, 
And that third act head, you know, the seams of that prosthetic are on camera. And it's rarely ever been done like that. Usually the seams of prosthetics on a face are behind, tucked behind the ears. And that makeup face, that third act face, was a, a six and one half hour just for that face. And Stefan and me and Rob's people would be going to work while the crew would be coming in from drinking. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it was six and a half hours to do that face, and then it was another half hour, hour and a half to put on the suit. And so we'd worked at essentially an eight and a half hour day before Paul started burning film. I think we only, we only would, you would only shoot five hours on that face or something like that before it was uh, done, something. Yeah, we were shooting, of course, 13, 14 hours, I think, but... Uh, but that face was that essentially face was, uh, Well, it took forever to, to get you into that. Yeah. Especially when it was... Uh, the, late, the, the latter part of it. Interesting enough, if you look at that, uh, what Rob Boutin did, the trick is, of course, that the lower, head, lower part of the head is, is the, sec the back part of the head is lower than the front part. So it looks like something is missing there, something. And yeah. of course, what he did is make the forehead longer. So you think, you think this is the skin, that is, this is real, but this is already not real here. It's upper part, so that you can immediately, so that this, the real head goes then uh, according to the skull. But the upper part, the frontal part, is about this higher. And that yeah. was, a, a, let's say, a really wonderful trick, so that you would be really deceived. Yeah, it was, and, 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 and all those guys, you know, what makes a, you know, a gifted movie is all those accidents, like Paul was talking about. But to talk about the, the movement of the deal, initially, Moni Akin and I had de developed a very, sort of liquid, serpentine sort of movement. And then whatever the, uh, you know, the Chinese word for crisis is the same for opportunity. And when we were trying to fit that particular movement, which I'd worked on for six months, into the suit, it wasn't going to work. So we spent a weekend uh, redesigning and tearing out parts of the inner suit. So with Rob and Paul shooting tests, and we had already been into the thick of the film at the time. And uh, you know, Moni took me aside and said, the constrictions of this suit will work for us. What you have to do is take the articulation or the staccato at the end of a movement and really make it pronounced and, and actually accentuate what he was saying in the beginning of it, really, really push out the chest. And I felt while I was doing these tests with Paul, I felt it was really phony and operatic and, you know, and corny. And, uh, that afternoon, we rented, Moni rented for me, he says, I want you to look at a guy who's a dancer, who's a mime, who's a singer, he's one of the great silent film stars ever. Uh, Nikolai Cherkasov was in uh, Eisenstein's uh, Ivan the Terrible. And I went back to the hotel, so I'm watching this with Moni, and you know, it's essentially, although it's stylized, it's a fairly naturalistically shot film, but you see Cherkasov at the beginning of it, you know, he looks like Dracula. He turns into the camera with this massive sort of operatic, stare and everything he does is heightened and it looks crazy for about five minutes but 20 minutes into it you completely are riveted by how gargantuan like these articulations of his of his body are so I watched that all week I watched that while I was shooting the first week of uh, the suit with Paul and I that's essentially what I started to work on and I just want to say that when I'm watching this film sometimes in the past, I haven't watched it in about 10 years, I watched it in Dallas about a month ago with, 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 Paul, with Ed and, uh, and Michael in Dallas with the Dallas crew. And it was the first time I really got out of my own way and looking at, well, I didn't have that movement down right, I didn't have this, all that, okay, that's when I was really cooking, and that's when Paul and I were really like moving the thing along. I really got out of the way myself and watched uh, the film as a film, like you said. I just have to say this, um, the thing I think that makes this film uh, non-ephemeral and maybe anthropological, maybe you can watch it in 200 years and see what the 20th century you know, uh, technology was about and privatization and social history and what would have happened if apartheid, you know, the whole film starts with the thing about apartheid. It turns out uh, what would have happened had not there been some sort of peace thing. It's loaded with social history, this film. And uh, I, when I got out of the way from Dallas, Sherry and I were watching it in Dallas and said, you know, I, I, I I just have to say I'm just extraordinarily proud to be part of 
a, a film as gifted as this, where as like Phil said, all of the accidents, the wonderful accidents that happen, uh, happen in conjunction with the extraordinary gifts of talent that were concerned with it. And on that note, I gotta say, Paul McCrane sitting in the back. There's uh, Miguel Ferrer, there's Felton over here. You know, Kurt Wood is here, you know. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal cast. And, uh, and Paul got to say one of my two favorite lines. It's also uh, uh, a favorite line of a lot of people. Uh, I like it. <laughs> Hey, Nancy, uh, you're, you're the only girl in this movie, in a weird way. I mean, you know, it's all, it's a real masculine thing. And uh, you, Well, you... there is Mrs. Murphy. Well, that's true. <laughs> you're the only girl with a gun. In the... what, what is it like to be uh, the girl in the action movie? I mean, what does that mean for you at all? Do you get women coming up to you and asking you about that? Um, no, not really. <laughs> I just want to say, I, unlike Paul, I thought it was a great script. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, that for me he was, it was okay I mean, wanting to work with Paul, I had seen Soldier of Orange, which I loved. And I read this script, and the first thing I thought was, well, Robocop, they'll change that. That's a terrible title. <laughs> um, but I sat down to read a few pages of it and just whipped through the script. And in that moment, I thought, I have to be in this movie. Um, I think that uh, the letters I've gotten have been probably more from men than from women about the role, <laughs> oddly enough, but uh, because they love this movie so much. And I'm very proud to be part of it. And I, I also want to say uh, about Peter, it took, you can't even imagine how much discipline to do what he did, to even, I mean, he was put together with a little screwdriver every day. It took hours and hours and hours. And um, I just think he was masterful in the role, really. Thank you for you, your cooperation. You, you, play a role, you play a role of a very strong-willed woman who knows what she wants and knows how to get it, and it's a cop. Now, that broke new ground. It broke new ground, I think, in terms of the characterization, but also the depiction of a woman playing, playing those roles. What, how did you get ready to do that? How did you do it so convincingly? Talk a little bit about your background Thank and you. prep. Thank you for the convincing part. Um, it was, you know, I was raised in New York. My father was a cop, so I thought I had some understanding of, of that. Um, I had uh, the wonderful Randy Moore training me with guns, and I think I went out, I remember going out to the police academy at some point, but. Wave your hand, Randy. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. He handled all the guns, the guns, all the guns on the movie. Um, you know, uh, really, I just looked at it in terms of the partnership. That, for me, was the most significant piece for me to look at in the movie. It's interesting that when I read the script after my disappointment in the beginning, of course, but I got over that and realized what <laughs> That it was really a, a fantastic script, in fact, and very innovative. And I think we did it in an innovative way, but it was already all on the page, clearly. It's, the strange thing is that when I read, the, which was the second draft, and um, I, I just came from Europe, so I immediately thought um, Robocop, or Murphy, Murphy in this case, in the beginning, should have an affair with Nancy. <laughs> and, I think the producers and Ed and, and Michael wrote that draft for me, which was the third draft, because that I thought was absolutely necessary, should be some, huh? <laughs> what the French like, yeah? And me, and me too, clearly. But <laughs> So then I got that script, the third draft, and I started reading, and then for the first time, I realized that I was in the United States and that it was just wrong. And that this whole affair was just a stupid European idea, and it should be taken out immediately. And I asked the writers to go back to the second draft and let's shoot that. It's very you know, strange. This, this, is a very, uh, this is a true story, and this is so unusual, I have to say, as an American screenwriter. Imagine if it had been an American director. 
he would have said, oh, you fucked it up, you're fired. And he didn't. He said, oh, I think I get the second draft. Let's go back to that. Yeah, and I, then from I really, that moment on, that, it was all full. I mean, he did that draft. For, for, for Paul, for Paul to say I was wrong, let's 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 put. The, he didn't the, say the, he was wrong. Well, <laughs> <laughs> for for him to say. Well, put, let put, me put, say it now. I must be completely wrong. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting because then I also realized that what had to be avoided was that there would be in the thinking of the audience, in the perception of the audience, a, a, a feeling that there should be something between Robocop or Murphy and, and uh, Lewis. Because, the, of course, as we look at the costume, there is not much chance to do any <laughs> stuff there. <laughs> and so I asked Nancy, which was probably not so nice, but it had to be done, to cut her hair and make herself a as boy-like as possible. Because I wanted to avoid any sexual thinking between Murphy, Robocop, and Lewis. And uh, then I asked her to eat a lot. <laughs> you might have forgotten so I that. smoking. <laughs> I don't even remember that. Oh, yes, I, I remember that I gained a lot of weight. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't mind getting my hair cut but eight times by four different people and the worst haircut in the world, that was not so fabulous. But I, I did, I thought it was also essential too to be very, to, I mean, obviously this would have been silly. So it worked, it worked really well. Why don't we open this up a little great. bit? Great, it's very great, thank you. He could question back, so. Yeah, back. yeah why I didn't want to direct the sequel. Well, there were several reasons. I think, first of all, of course, the original writers were not there anymore. That was the main reason, I think. Although they had worked a little bit at the beginning of the second, of the, of the second episode, but ultimately somebody else was brought in. And that made it, I felt, very uncomfortable there. And then on top of that, I hate to do sequels, really. I have, in fact, I have been fortunate to be able to refuse them all. <laughs> and it came close, certainly with Basic Instinct too. But I'm so glad I didn't do it, you know. <laughs> right over here, and then we'll move around the room. But uh, shout it out. The, uh, the ending of this movie is extraordinarily satisfying, and I'm wondering if uh, um, Well, uh, you know, it actually, uh, we actually had a, uh, an, uh, there was an ending we cut off the movie. It was a little more of an, a movie. They, uh, all the media breaks were wrapped up. And we showed that at one screening, and, the, and Mike Medivar, who's not here, told us to cut it out because there were breasts in it. Woo! He said, the tits are out. Um, and they were. Uh, but uh, no, the movie was, that was pretty much the script as it was. I think it, was, it went to the natural ending. Um, it was hard to get to that. John Davison came up with the last line, you're fired, uh, one day in a meeting. And I thought, wow, that's a really smart idea. We put it in. And uh, I don't know, Mike and I, and then Paul and I, and, uh, were, you know, worried it forever. Until, uh, until we couldn't anymore. The, the, the fourth directive is interesting because it, it really is the kryptonite. And be, because it's laid in there and everyone's watching it over two or three tracks through the whole film, um, I didn't think it was going to work. I was wrong. I said, nobody's going to get that. But everybody got it. So thank God for that. <laughs> right back here. One thing that is most indelible about it to me, even when the concept of sound editing is brought up, and sound design is this film. You just feel it in your gut. Every, every movement of Robocop, every industrial hum in the background. I'm just wondering um, how much of that was apart from the beginning, from the script, from? It was all in the script. Oh, come on. That was Steve <laughs> Flick. <laughs> Steve Flick uh, won an Academy Award and should have, I believe, uh, for this movie. And the music was not in the script. Do you think that there is room in the modern American lexicon for more action blockbusters that are quite as critical of our current society as this film was at its time? Okay, I'd like to jump right into that. I, uh, someone a little smarter than me pointed out that most of the superhero films after 9-11 endorse the Bush Doctrine, which is essentially a first strike or a preemptive strike. And, and this narrative is different. It's a Western in which the uh, law enforcer turns on the company that 
fabricated it. So maybe we've closed a door on that kind of storytelling. I don't know. I thought the, the Avengers was like a Nickelodeon cartoon com compared to this, but you know. This question is for the writers. If uh, Ryan had decided to go with you guys for the sequel, was there any specific area you wanted to uh, explore with Robocop or where, where, you, where you'd want to take him? Ed had the greatest idea for the sequel that, that he told me, or the, yeah, it was, uh, uh, I think, was it, you were telling me that, that um, they wanted to, maybe to be a black Robocop at one point, and, and Ed had the, the great idea to call it Brobocop. <laughs> and he's not working on it anymore. Do you want to, do you want to, well, we were force majeured off of the sequel because of the writer's strike. Um, at Act of God, uh, force majeure Latin, uh, uh, which meant that- Yes, we were, that's Latin. We, we were replaced by someone who actually Ed brought into the original Robo yeah. family, uh, Frank Miller. Um, so you have who said that? <laughs> you want to say any more about that, Ed? About that? Frank we, Miller? We, we actually wrote a, a first draft of Robocop 2 before this, the strike happened, and essentially, He's in this fight with some bad guys, and somebody pulls out an RPG and hits him in the chest with it. And we have a, a, a title card 25 years later, and we go down into a sub-basement, and we find him in suspended animation like Han Solo in, at the end of the second uh, uh, Star Wars film. And we didn't get much further than that. The, the, oh, we were working for Oliver Stone, and I think the villain became Oliver Stone. The, there were sex bots. Well, one of our jokes was, uh, uh, c come down to the Derrick and pump some sex bots. That was the Derrick was a bar in old Detroit. So we tried to keep the tradition going. I had read that um, there was a possibility of making Lewis, you know, a, a, a cyborg as well. And I was wondering, Nancy, were you looking forward to that opportunity to? Not, not even a little bit. No. <laughs> I could never do what he did. Actually, there was a funny story about that because I ran into Nancy when we were writing this stupid idea about 25 years ahead, and I said, hey, we're going to put you in the movie and we're going to age you. And she said, I'm not going to be in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> On this side. You know, back there. Um, my question is, uh, who, uh, who came up with the idea of establishing the world by showing commercials in the news? Because I think it, the way it sets up the tone of the world and... Mm -hmm. and you know, society, and I, I, it's brilliant. That was in the script. That was something Mike and I did. And, and Paul didn't like. And Paul didn't cut it out. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We, we actually had a lot of fun with the media breaks. It was sort of an unalloyed um, a political commentary. We, we just really, it was some of the, the fun, most fun writing, writing time we had. Yeah, I think I think the idea of being able to cut to it before that there had always been you know you would cut to the studio and then you would usually have a camera uh, somebody would would have would shoot the back of a camera and then you would go into the, the scene that way but Paul just said we'll just cut right into it and I guess it's called Brechtian I learned later. Strangely enough, that was based on on the painter Mondrian. I was thinking about these black lines that he has in his uh, later abstract paintings between the, the blue and the red uh, squares and the black lines like this. And I thought that the movie should be that way. So there would be scenes and then bump something else and then back to the scenes. So when I read that, in, which was already presented in the script, I immediately thought we should not be trying to integrate this kind of in that the, the, it's playing in the, in, uh, when the officers go to work or whatever, you know, putting it into the scene. And just forget about that and just say, bomb. And I think that still it was very um, audacious of the writers to present it that way, you know. And, and I'm glad I followed uh, their cue and, didn't, uh, and did it that way. Actually, Paul's, Paul came up with the Heart commercial. So the Heart commercial, we care, Mr. Verhoeven. <laughs> Yeah, but the, the, the question of trivializing the media, trivializing the, the news, taking serious events and putting a spin on them that's entertaining, that's a very contemporary theme. At the time when you did this, I think you were kind of way out there. 
Well, you know, actually, if you look, I didn't know this until after the movie because I watched Soldier of Orange after I saw this movie. But if you look at the newsreel footage in Soldier of Orange, Paul's already well aware of playing around with media. Uh -huh. So we were lucky to get him. And yeah, we had independently come up with this idea of, I would say it's probably we're the Saturday Night Live generation. So, you know, we stole it from them a little bit just oh. as a way to go in and what I, quickly, what I find interesting about it is it's, it's a lovely way to put a lot of exposition in fast. And that's yeah. what I like about yeah. it. And also, the, the media breaks fall and act breaks r at roughly 30 or 35 minute intervals too. So there's sort of like uh, closing of one curtain and opening of another. And you know, the rise of action with, with Robocop out on the street. That ends with the, the mayor hostage, and then we, he beautifully transitions into a media break. End of act one. On and on it goes. I, I'm just wondering about this, because I've always complained of this, because I've never noticed a character like Robocop that's like half human, half cyborg, and is like the hero of like an action film. I've never seen that before Robocop. So question for the writers is, like, how did you exactly come up with that? Like. Uh, some kind of weird inspiration involving a car accident or some sort of weird, I don't know, like just a, a curiosity. How would you create this weird toaster man character? So, yeah. You know, there were some, uh, you know, it's a, a, a process of addition, obviously. And I, I, I knew, knew very little about the movement uh, uh, exercises that, that Peter went through. I, I mean, I watched him do it and I was amazed. and. I thought he, you know, was a good mime when he was in college or something, but, you know, one of the things we had rules for RoboCop, the sort of John Wayne rules: he can't kiss the girl, he can't be seen on a telephone, and he can't fly. And they did all three of those things in number three <laughs> when we weren't around. So we also talked a lot about the Man in the Iron Mask and Frankenstein and those eternal themes. I had, uh, I mean, my idea came, I was actually working um, on another movie uh, in the art department. Um, I, I wasn't officially working on the movie, but it was shooting near my office. It was Blade Runner. And, and I watched that movie for four nights, and then someone told me it was about a robot, and they pointed at Sean Young, who was wearing a tutu, and they said, that's the robot. And I said, no, that's not the robot. <laughs> and uh, so I had an image of this robot trying to figure out, this robot cop trying to figure out human behavior. And it may have been based a little bit on my experiences that night on the big Blade Runner street. But um, then later I thought about it would be interesting if the person wasn't a robot, but was a human being who was coping with, with being a machine. That that was the future, that we weren't going to avoid it, that we were it. And that was kind of where it came from me. All movies are in some way a dialogue. We, you know, we learn from past masters of the craft. Are there any other films you'd want to talk about that you hadn't about anyone here, and Paul particularly, that, and any that you had in the back of your mind as you were conceiving of this quite original work? Yeah, my movie about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was a big Dirty Harry fan. Listen, I'd like to add something about what Paul just said about uh, Jesus. You know, there's a theme in this. I venture to say the thing that makes it uh, non-ephemeral and long-lasting and why people go back to it is, uh, you know, aside from the brilliance of the writing and the comedy and the good guys and the bad guys and the win and the loss, there's, uh, like all great stories, particularly in Western literature, there's, an, there's a theme that, I, and I, I, you know, is is, this is kudos to Paul, because I don't know if American would have gotten it, but there are images, and there's constant images of resurrection. And if, if the movie itself isn't about resurrection, where a guy ends up saying Murphy, uh, if that's not blatant enough, then, you know, there are, it's not just, you know, uh, gospel resurrection, but, you know, resurrection is a topos that comes from Egypt, it's Persian, it's Pharisaic, uh, Jewish, and it comes from the Golem, Frankenstein, whatever. But uh, the great films always, and the great stories always, are someone who's taken back from death and been reborn. And Paul has, you know, there has infused it with images from it, you know, to, and they're subtle. But I just have to have to hearken back to, a, a it's sort of a nice argument that Paul and I had in my hotel room when we were reading through the script. He, right before I was starting, we'd read through the script and I'd ask him questions. And it seemed to me, and it seemed to a couple of uh, people, that 
uh, bear with me here, and it's an American thing, and I direct a lot of television now, and the television Hollywood way is to go about this. Follow me. This is the revision of RoboCop. That RoboCop is RoboCop, and then Nancy Allen comes along and says, sees him twirling the gun and goes, Murphy, it's you. And then he goes out and arrests Paul McCrane. Paul McCrane hears him say the words that remind him of when he was busted, right? This is the f evidence of physical... This is the physical, this is the evidence in a physical world. And then Robocop would go back and start to have dreams, you see? And this is the Western way of looking at it. That physical evidence motivates then us going home and having dreams and, and self-realization. So I was asking Paul, I said, why is he having these dreams? And you might remember this conversation, but it was absolutely uh, uh, transforming to me. I said, why is he having these dreams first? Why isn't he like, which is what I'm used to seeing in the Hollywood film, going out and having a physical experience and then coming back and having some sort of mental deal or you know, soulful deal. And then Paul said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, no, 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 no. You got, you got this back backwards. Because the one thing that they have not taken away from him, and I'm paraphrasing this context, is his soul. And the soul is waking up on its own. Uh, and you could fill in the blanks there because it's God given, you know, because it's given by the cosmos, because that's the thing that technology, progress, privatization, and all the things that have taken these things away from them cannot take. And that's what's waking up, and then the soul wakes up, and then it's born out again in a physical world. You get that? Okay. That's the miracle of this film, man. And I'm telling you, I'm in, a, I'm in a meeting today in a TV series, which is great, so forth, and they want that. They want, you know, the physical life to happen first, and then the girl goes home, and she has a couple of dreams, and then she realizes the epiphany. You know what I'm saying? And that's the way it's done in uh, Hollywood, and it's not the way it's done in this movie, man. And I want you to say, the magic of this movie are these images, are the magic underneath it all are these images of resurrection and subsequently the life of the soul that transcends all this other Michigas that Robocop goes through. I think that's what makes the movie non-ephemeral. I, I think eventually when they say Murphy and everybody goes, wow, that's what everybody's getting out of it, is resurrection. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> From um, creative, artistic, or whatever you want to call it, I can talk about the soul clearly because we can, in a movie, we can believe in the soul. Unfortunately, I don't think it exists. Ah. So drive well, home you, carefully. Well, you sure had me in that hotel room, man. <laughs> let, me, let me say, a lot of people talk about this is a cult movie. I think that's wrong, wrong phrase. It's a movie that's Oh, it's about, a universal movie, man. Yeah, a movie about stuff. Yeah. That matters, yeah. and it's done with an artistry that realizes that full potential at at every at every point, and that the that there's an enduring interest and will continue to have an enduring interest. I'm absolutely convinced. So I'm very honored to be you, here you among know, you guys. Ed said uh, uh, at the end of the process, uh, boy, this is when we that was they we made when no one was looking, and I went, what was he talking about? But clearly. The, 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 even at that time, the studios would squeeze the life out of things. And so the sort of yeah. b bottom up organizational principle, we, we, there were eight pieces of good luck that happened that sort of lined up. And, and you, try to, you can't legislate that. Any last words here? Paul, you, you should have the last word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will use it to thank Peter Vella for what he had to go through and what he achieved and for a, a very important creative cooperation. I, I mean, we had our conflicts, we solved them, and we went on, and we went on, and he had very hard times, clearly, with that costume, terrible costume to, to work in. You know, he couldn't really walk, everything was terrible. And he had to go through that, but that is not the point. The point is that what Peter did is, in the, in the framework of, of the film, I believe in the soul too. I mean, for me, the movie was, I wanted to make the movie right at the moment that I read the scene that he went, uh, goes back to his house. 
and get his dreams about or I rem mem uh, memories, isn't it? That was the moment that I, when I got to that point that I thought, I'm going, I want to make this movie, this is beautiful from an artistic point of view. You know, I'm, 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 there is a difference between me as an artist and me as an, uh, let's say, a thinking being. And what Peter did is bring that soul that is so important to the movie to the screen. And he did that in the most, let's say, normal way, without pushing ever, with, uh, always keeping, let's say, a very cool uh, uh, approach to that, which I love in, in any art, that it is not on your nose, but it is really a little bit at a, at a certain distance. And Peter did that in the most beautiful way. And I love you very much, Peter. I love you, Uh, you know, and just before uh, just before we go, it's, a, it's not a quid pro quo, but like I say, you know, I just did, finished directing a television series and another one so forth, and I rip off his stuff all the time. I ripped off his stuff yesterday. If you notice, I don't know if you guys are film students out here, he, he's a master at hinging people into another action, pulling people out of cars, hinging them one way, going the other. There's a there's a there's a consistency and an and an action to his movies that I've stolen from him from the from the day I met him. And also, I also this is another steal, thing I steal from him. I hear this in my mind, and Nancy remembers this too. Why aren't we shooting? Remember this? <laughs> Why aren't we shooting? And you know, I say that daily, man. You know, as this guy, he hit the ground in seventh gear every day. I mean, he's already in seventh gear. And Nancy and I go, God, doesn't he warm up? I mean, isn't there like, you know, isn't there sort of like, you know, go to the set, kind of rehearse, have some coffee? No, not with Paul, man. <laughs> Seven o'clock in the morning, you are going 180 miles an hour until the rat, man. And I, I gleaned that from him, stolen it from him, referred him to everybody in the world, and I'm as grateful to you as you are to me, man. So I love you. People talk, talk about the fact that really, really great movies are written four times. They're written in the initial script, they're rewritten in the production, they're rewritten in the editing, and finally, they're rewritten by the audience who bring their own experience and values. The fact that we have an audience here, both the creative people involved in this project, but also a lot of other people, including young people who or have seen this film multiple times, suggest it will keep be rewritten again and again into the future. Thank you. Thank you.